Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, The Pulse Nightclub Failure, High Liability Problems in the Safe Management of Nightclubs and Bars. In today's webinar, Mr. Dale Yeager will discuss what really happened at the Pulse Nightclub and whether it was a failure of management and security. The webinar will cover five key issues related to safety and security problems. Understanding general management practice and security as it relates to accidents, the bouncer issue, what you don't know about crowd control, the door, security plans, and the culture of the venue. To give you a little background about our presenter, Dale Yeager, he's a forensic profiler and federal subject matter expert with training by the United States Department of Justice and Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Mr. Yeager is a frequent expert with media outlets, including a featured episode of Forensic Files and a new History Channel series entitled True Monsters. Yale is also a federal law enforcement instructor and SME for high-intensity drug trafficking areas and Mid Middle Atlantic Great Lakes Organized Crime Law Enforcement Network programs. Attendees who require a passcode, the word for today is failure. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget, widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with a link to the archive recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the Resource Center to the left of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Dale, the presentation is now turned over to you. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about a very current issue, the Pulse nightclub uh, shooting. And one of the things that I want to be clear about up front is that I'm going to be addressing both attorneys who represent nightclubs and live venues and entertainment companies, as well as plaintiff's attorneys who have actions or, or contemplated actions against nightclubs or live venues or entertainment uh, facilities. We're going to talk specifically about nightclubs today, but this is also relevant to bars, concerts, sports arenas. It's all part of the same process. One of the things that I'm very proud of is that over the years we have worked for, as risk management consultants and trainers, some of the top uh, entertainment companies in the country, SB Entertainment Group, which owns three of the largest nightclubs in West Hollywood, as well as Live Nation, uh, Gaylord Hotel Chain, uh, among others. And one of the things that frustrates me is that many nightclub owners refuse to fix their problems or even understand their problems. Well, we're going to expose those today for both sides, uh, whether you are working for an entertainment or a, or a nightclub uh, company or you are representing a, a uh, complainant. Uh, this is going to be relevant for both because there are a lot of dirty secrets that need to be exposed. And the Pulse nightclub, uh, as sad as it is, and it's very sad as a terrorist act in U.S. soil, uh, there are some serious problems that need to be addressed. Uh, related to that crime. A well-managed company is a safe company. Uh, some of you may know who Dr. Peter Drucker was. Dr. Drucker, for those of you who don't know, was the person who invented modern management practice. The way your law firm is currently run, the way your company is currently run, the, the title, the structure, the, the basics of that were invented by that man. I was honored to be his student for 15 years. And one of the things he used to talk about was, I don't train managers, I train leaders. And leaders have to make difficult decisions. And one of the things he used to say constantly was, a well-managed company is a safe company. And this is part of the problem. When you see high turnover rates, when you see uh, lots of workplace aggression, theft, that type of thing, that's a poorly managed company. And so safety goes out the window when you have poor management. And we're going to focus on this management issue because it's certainly relevant uh, in any kind of legal action or protecting your uh, client from legal action. U.S. nightclubs are death traps. Five dirty secrets nightclubs don't want you to know. 
this was a blog post I put up several weeks ago and got about 20,000 views. Uh, it was a hot, a hot topic at the time because of, of Pulse. Let's go through those very quickly. There was no exterior security walk to identify potential threats. Exterior security walks are something that have been recommended to the nightclub, live venue, sports arena industry by Homeland Security since post 9-11. I mean, for numerous years, well over a decade, this is something they've talked about. It is not brain surgery to have a security person walk around the parking lot every 15 to 30 minutes. In many cities, such as Orlando, there's a portal law, P, portal with a P, which states how many feet outside of your doors are you required to secure. That varies from municipality and city to city, but this is part of the process. You're required to be outside, moving around, making sure that you are securing all of your doors. And one of the things that would have prevented this crime or reduced the uh, the number of deaths and injuries significantly was a simple outside walk. Let me tell you why. Mateen, the shooter, uh, walked from the parking lot into the nightclub with a three-foot rifle. Actually, an AR-15 is about three and a half feet long, with ammo and a pistol. This is not something in the summer heat or even in the summer heat of Orlando that you're going to hide very well. And he actually, uh, from reports that we got uh, from police, that he was actually hiding this, stashing this, this, these items on the side of the building. Again, a simple exterior walk could have prevented that from happening. Ironically, the Aurora movie theater shooting could have also been prevented completely by an exterior walk, which again, Homeland Security had told movie theater um, uh, owners, businesses that manage movie theaters, had told them for years to do this at special events. If you remember in that shooting, Aurora, uh, Colorado, there was a, a midnight screening of Batman, and all they had to do was make sure the doors were secured. This is how the shooter got in, how he got his weapons in the door. Uh, a, simple, a simple walk would have prevented that. The first 911 call came from a patron, not a security person. It was 34 minutes until a Pulse manager called 911. Where was security? Why weren't they calling 911? No lockdown of the doors to protect the patrons from entry by the shooter. Three different doors that the person had to go through. Any one of them could have been barricaded. A nightclub needs to have a barrier. It has to have barriers to prevent this type of thing from happening. And this first person shooter issue at nightclubs, bars, live events, concerts, those types of places has been addressed over and over and over again by Homeland Security. But again, it's not being heated to. And it doesn't cost anything to, uh, to actually secure your building. Next, why are U.S. nightclubs unsafe? Most security people at nightclubs are untrained college jocks or wannabe MMA fighters. I can tell you from our division that does nightclub work and bars and, and sports arenas that most of these bouncers, most of these security people are poorly trained and they have very bad attitudes. One of the things that we notice quite a bit is that security guards routinely are hitting on the women that come in the door or the men that are coming in the door in the case of gay nightclubs, uh, they are not paying attention to what they're doing. They actually want to fight. We find that their attitude is unbelievable, uh, unbelievably unprofessional and aggressive. So they're not going to prevent anything. Secondly, some nightclubs, and this is the worst situation of all, hire local security guard companies. Guard companies are some of the sleaziest businesses in the United States, and I'm not, I'm not overstating that. They are run by people who really could care less, and some of them, and I'm talking about national uh, guard, security guard companies too, which are poorly run. They run on a very tight, very small profit margin, and these security guards get paid very poorly, and then they receive training from the security guard company that is geared towards protecting the security guard company from being sued. They're not there to protect the client. Uh, it, it's a mess. And even some of these major companies, which I will not mention, I have had experience with them, and they are no better than the local Yokel security guard company down the lane. Number three, most nightclubs in the U.S. have never had a security audit. They have no idea what their weaknesses are, what their problems are. Uh, this is very, very important uh, that you understand that. They don't, 
they don't have any idea of what's going on. I mean, you audit your books, you audit other things, but you don't audit. Uh, security uh, nightclubs do not audit their own procedures. What's working, what's not, what is their weakness, what are their strengths. They've never done it. They just guess at it. Most nightclubs are not compliant with the active shooter prep, uh, preparedness protocols of Homeland Security. One thing that we do is do assessments of these protocols of the um, security procedures in a nightclub. We find constantly, every venue, they are not compliant with these active shooter preparedness protocols. And what was this at Pulse Nightclub? An active shooter. Lastly, most nightclubs have no female security personnel. Well, why is that important? Well, restrooms are dangerous places and they need to be monitored for nefarious behavior. How will you do that without a female security person? Also, female security people can do things males cannot. They can de-escalate an aggressive situation with males where a male will actually aggravate the situation. So what we're going to do before we continue on is I'm going to turn this back over to Naja and have her uh, talk about the passcode issue. Thanks, Dale. Um, since we're only going to have one Q&A, which is going to be at the end of the program, we ask that you type in your passcode in the Q&A widget now. Um, you could also send your questions through as well, and I'll just save them for the end of the presentation. Thank you. Dale, you can continue. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we move on. General management practice and security. One of the, when you talk about liability, and this is, a, this is an obsession with us at Sarah because liability is, is, in our experience, generally human error, and that human error can be not paying attention, not being well managed, not being well trained, or just pure laziness and unprofessionalism. But poorly hired, trained, and managed security people cause liability. The hiring practice in most nightclubs, live venues, and that type of thing that hires security people, they will do a basic 50-state background check. So while that's good, it's incomplete. One thing that people don't realize is, and I know most of you, because your attorneys know this to be true, background checks are horribly inaccurate. 15 to 20 percent of the information that you pull up is even relevant, or it, it's just wrong. Secondly, it doesn't tell you about the attitude of the person doesn't explain to you who that person is. So what happens is that they hire people based on size. The best security person I've ever worked with, which was at the House of Blues on Sunset, uh, was a woman who was five foot two inches tall. She was a very small person, maybe weighed a buck 25, 125 pounds soaking wet. She was phenomenal. She knew how to pick out phony IDs. She knew how to de-escalate verbally. She did more work in one night than any six foot five, 280 pound guy could ever do. The problem is, is that when people hire security people, they think of size. Size does not equal skill. Skill for a security person is their brain and their communication skills. Then training. Training is poor. They'll say, well, here you are going to shadow Bobby tonight and he's going to show you what to do. And then Bobby tells them, well, here's what we need to do. Here's the book that you need to look at. These are our rules. And basically, that's not training. That's not mentoring. Those people are, are poorly trained. They need to be trained over a period of time. In the case of some venues, it takes six weeks to properly train a security person. And then the management of security people causes liability. I've watched many times when general managers or the security managers uh, aren't even paying attention to their security people. Uh, I see this constantly. So this is another issue. Next, security affects every aspect of the management of an entertainment venue. Uh, poor security issue, with, with poor security, you're going to have money management issues because you're going to have internal theft. And this is a problem constantly with nightclubs. Employee management, you're going to have a difficulty because the security people are going to cause problems that affect every employee in that, in that nightclub, in that facility. And then secondly is supply management, internal theft of product. Uh, this is a nightclub. They're selling alcohol. So security is really uh, something that affects every aspect, all three key aspects of a nightclub operation or live venue operation. Certainly in Vegas they understand this, and this is, this is why they take security so seriously. 
The bouncer issue. I hate the word bouncer. I don't train bouncers. My people do not train bouncers. We take bouncers. We take those that are trainable, teachable, and we turn them into security professionals. The term bouncer is equal to the word thug. Bouncer means muscle. It means physical aggression. If you have to uh, grab someone and throw them out of a nightclub, you're, you're poorly trained, you've got a bad attitude, and you didn't know how to de-escalate or uh, deal with them at the front door. So ultimately, bouncers are going to cause more problems than they solve. They're also going to be egomaniacs, and we've talked previously about their aggression towards females and males and uh, the, the general problems they cause. A bouncer's ego causes problems because they want to fight. You'll see them blow up when a group of males come in. Uh, I've watched bouncers who are males kind of blow up, puff out their chest to, be, to look good. That's an insecurity. They shouldn't be involved in security at all. A bouncer is not a professional. They're an amateur. Until you train them, until they're qualified, properly trained, and managed, they are not security professionals. They are bouncers. They're nothing more than thugs. What you don't know about crowd control. Well, crowd control is key. Uh, certainly in Pulse nightclub, there was no crowd control because there was no door control. There was no security on any, on any professional level. Who's in the crowd? Well, the first thing you need to understand is who's your crowd? What's the nightclub? We've worked for many gay-dominated nightclubs in West Hollywood and, and Las Vegas and other places around the United States. Gay nightclubs have unique issues that uh, nightclubs that cater to primarily heterosexual people do not have. And so ultimately, you have to understand those issues. You also have to understand the geography. Where Pulse was located is a specific neighborhood. People don't realize that in Orlando, Florida, uh, Orlando, Florida has a great uh, deal of crime, has a very high violent crime rate. When you go to Walt Disney World, you're actually in Kissimmee. You're in the suburbs. You're not in actual Orlando, technically. And uh, if you've ever traveled to downtown Orlando on a Saturday night, you would know the difference quickly. So you have to know that neighborhood. You have to understand who's the crowd, who's feeding, who are they coming from, uh, what's their makeup, uh, socioeconomics, and, and, and all of that plays into this. And this is where training comes in. Venue design. And, and let me go back to number one. Our shooter was a frequent uh, person uh, who frequented this nightclub quite a bit. And this is someone that the security people should have known and should have been observing as someone who came in by himself uh, routinely. Uh, loners are very odd people when it comes to nightclubs. You generally don't go to a nightclub as a loner. It's very odd. They should have picked up on that. There was a lot of, a lot of problems with that. Venue design. If you look at the outlay of Pulse, uh, it had a lot of problems. It was designed uh, poorly and it had a lot of issues when it came to crowd control and trying to get them out the door. Because frankly, I'm going to tell you, after uh, being operational, with, uh, with the federal uh, entities I work with and doing what I've done for 25 years, the people that live are outside the building. That's, that's the bottom line. And very un it's very unusual for people that hide to ever live, very unusual. Um, venue design plays an important role in evacuation, whether it's fire, whether it's uh, uh, gunfire. The verbal control issue. You have to train people how to control a large crowd. When people are freaking out, when they're emotional, you have to be able to control them, and that takes very, very specialized training, which obviously was not a part of what was going on here uh, in the operation of this venue, as with most nightclubs that I've experienced. The door issue. You either control ingress and egress, or you don't. When it comes to security, and I know this is going to sound odd for some of you. There is no such thing as gray. Uh, there is black and white. Either you do it well or you do it poorly. There's never okay. Okay gets people hurt and killed. So the door issue. Control happens at the door. You have to assess people as they're coming through the door. You have to assess groups. You can tell who's going to be a problem when they walk in that door if you have the proper training and the, and the experience. Experience is key, too. Understanding who to watch and who to monitor. Getting on that radio and saying, we need to monitor these people. When you have someone like uh, the shooter in the Pulse nightclub coming in and out, in and out, in and out, you have to pay attention to people that are what we call travelers.
people that move back and forth quickly because they're generally involved in nefarious behavior. Could be sex in a car, could be drugs, drug dealing, it could be a lot of things, but back and forth in and out of a nightclub is very unusual. Usually people go in, they stay for a period of time, enjoy themselves and leave. Going back and forth should have alerted security right away. Number two, prevention happens at the door. Again, you have to look at the door, you have to watch the people coming in and, in and out. In this case, you had the shooter moving in and out quickly uh, over uh, quite a few times that evening based on the report. So very, very important that we do that. We look at that. So I'm going to spend some time on this slide because this is so very, very important. So let me give an example of a situation that I experienced. I was at a venue in California at one point and uh, in, in Southern California. And it was um, an evening, it was about nine, nine o'clock at night. There was a band on stage that was kind of a, a pop band and they were um, family oriented. So there were a lot of people in this venue that were moms and dads and, and children. Well, the problem was that the local street gang, one of the local street gangs, I believe at the time it was Crips, might've been Bloods, I'm not sure. Um, but one of them showed up. They got their night messed up. They thought there was a different group on that night than was on. Well, they walked in the door. Immediately, they were annoyed. Well, problem number one, as I'm watching this, because we're auditing, I have my, my VP with me, and we're auditing this nightclub that night to see how well it's managed, how well the security people handle it. I thought to myself right away, why are the security people not picking up that this group of people are wearing colors? Uh, they are obviously gang members, and they're not doing anything about it. They're not radio. Uh, they're not on the radio, explaining to each other what's happening. And so I watched. They went inside. I mentioned to the, one of the door people. I said, "You realize that's a street gang?" He said, "Well, they're kind of like bumblebees. I'll never forget this this statement. They're like bumblebees. If you don't bother them, they'll they'll eventually leave." I said, "Really?" I said, "I don't think that's going to happen." So I was prepared to call 911 because it, it didn't look like it was going to go well. Coming in the front door, this was the back door, there were two entrances to this uh, venue, one in the front and one in the back. They were both street level. In the front door where I couldn't see walked another gang, an opposing gang that, that had a problem with the gang that, was, that had previously come in. Well, you know how to finish this story. By about 10.30 that night, all hell broke loose, and they went at each other. Thankfully, no guns. They just were beating the living day lights out of each other. Well, chaos ensued. You've got families in there with children. Now I'm watching the security people. Well, my VP and I, he's Maza, uh, we didn't have any choice. We had to jump in. It was the ethical thing to do, and we had to help out. And so we, we ended up rescuing children from being sexually assaulted. It was a night. I'll never forget, blood all over my shirt. As they went at it, they start leaving, and they, the security people told them to get the hell out, just like that, very professionally. I shook my head in disgust. And then all of a sudden, they said, F you, man, we're coming back. And, and the security person said something quite unbelievably unprofessional, but uh, didn't shock me after what I had seen that evening. He said, you go get your effing pistol. Well, guess what? Guy went up to, uh, to the street, went to a vehicle, got out a gun, came back, and started shooting. Now it was even worse. Now the sheriff's department shows up, the police department, if I remember correctly, five different departments show up. It was war in the street with children running around and parents. It was a nightmare. And I remember um, after it finally stopped, Many people were injured. Many people were arrested. I remember the next day walking into the CEO's office along with his vice president and sitting down and just staring. He said, well, we had quite a, quite a night last night. I said, you know what? I said, I'm going to be professional. But I said, I'm going to give you my assessment before I write this report and send it to you. He goes, I know we did poorly last night. I said, poorly? 
I said children were injured, regular families were injured. I said the police, four different or five different departments had to show up. I said, you're just lucky that people didn't get killed. I said, this is a mess. I said, your managers can't manage. Your security people don't know anything. They're actually inciting problems. And we eventually went in there, worked with that venue and fixed it. Took about two and a half years. And we had to fire 30% of the managers and security personnel. I'm talking about everybody. Uh, it was a mess. But we eventually cleaned it up and, and watched the venue flourish and reduce its aggression. This is the issue of culture, security plans and the culture of the venue. If you're an attorney and you have a contemplated action or you, you're actively involved in an action where you're representing a plaintiff and you're suing a nightclub or a, or a venue operator, uh, you need to understand this concept because ultimately, what do I do as an expert? What do my experts do on these cases? We're trying to look at policy, look at the actions the management of those policies, how they're enacted, how they're executed, and try to look at what the um, what the rule of law is stating about their liability. You know, what what were they required to do? What was the minimum standard? This issue is so very important because when you look at when we're auditing a venue or any kind of an entertainment venue or sports arena, we have to look at that culture. Is the culture casual? Is it amateur? Uh, are people treating each other in an amateur kind of way, or do you see professionalism? When I go to Walt Disney World, and I've, I've been there 20 times, um, I'm a mouse junkie, uh, the one thing I love about Walt Disney World is the customer service and the professionalism. This is a company that absolutely knows how to manage a facility, how to manage a very large facility. When you go to Disneyland, which of course is much smaller, you still see that same quality. Anytime you're on a Disney property, you see a professionalism. People are pleasant, they're nice, they're telling you have a magical day, but there's a professionalism, and that's what you're paying for. That's what you enjoy if you like to go to Walt Disney World. I'm also a, a Marriott guy. I like to use Marriott properties, frankly, because in all of my years of business travel, I've never had a bad stay at a Marriott. They're clean, they're well-managed, that's the key word, well-managed. There's a culture of pleasantry, but also professionalism when you go into a Marriott property. So that issue of culture plays a big role when you have litigation. So if you're an attorney right now, and you represent a nightclub or a bar or some type of a live venue, uh, this is something you need to be asking yourself as a legal professional. What is the culture within that venue? Because ultimately, even though you're there to protect them, the liability can get to a point, and we see this over and over again throughout the U.S. and Canada where we work, where local municipalities have had enough. Uh, they eventually say, we're pulling your license, uh, you're violating zoning laws, you've got uh, crowds out there at 2 in the morning disturbing the neighbors, causing chaos, causing parking problems, and eventually the cash cow, which a nightclub, unless you don't know what you're doing, is uh, it's quite a cash cow, it's quite an ATM, it makes money, uh, ends up stopping. Money isn't made anymore, people are out of work, and ultimately uh, this hurts a lot of people when this culture of casualness, this culture of amateur hour uh, is prevalent in a facility. So the first place we see this culture problem is an emergency plan. An emergency plan is after the fact. It doesn't prevent anything. An emergency plan is a cleanup list. I don't know about you, but I don't like to clean. So ultimately, uh, the emergency plan says, here's what you do in the event of a shooter, in the event of a fire, in the event of an accident or a fall. It doesn't prevent anything. And one of the things that I find odd, uh, because I come out of the law enforcement world on a federal level, but when you work in the entertainment industry, I'm just going to use that as a general term for nightclubs and venues, I find it odd that when you tell people that, who are owners, who are general managers, they look at you like you have six heads. Uh, well, it's an emergency plan. You have to have an emergency plan. I said, what about a plan that actually predicts and prevents? 
And that is such a odd thing to them. It's such an odd concept to them. Uh, in some ways, they, they view it as counterintuitive. Well, an emergency plan is important, and you have to have one, and you have to have one that people have actually trained on. And this culture has to understand that when things go bad, whether it be a shooting, whether it be a fire, whether it be a fall, all hands are on deck to protect the patron, number one, and protect the property, number two. Ultimately, that's the two things that have to be done. So one of the things we look at in the emergency plan is duplication. Well, let me tell you about duplication. We also have an education division, 30,000 K-12 private and public schools. We use the same process to look at their emergency plans. And here's what we find that nightclubs and public schools and private schools have in common. They borrow from other people's emergency plans. They're actually too unprofessional and too lazy to design their own plan. Their plan has to be, a plan has to be custom designed for the facility. You can't borrow someone else's. We find constantly in our auditing that an emergency plan for a nightclub was borrowed from someone else or it's a template that they grabbed off the internet. And you start reading through it line by line. And what you notice is that the emergency plan isn't even relevant to that type of building or that structure or that neighborhood, or even what the nightclub does. Some nightclubs serve food, some do not. So an emergency plan tells you a lot about the culture when it comes to laziness and a lack of professionalism. If you're an attorney who represents nightclub owners or entertainment venue uh, operators, you need to talk to them about this because that emergency plan is what's gonna sink them in any negotiation on a civil suit. It's going to be the emergency plan that gets them every time. The second thing is a security plan. So I previously talked about prediction and prevention. So prediction and prevention. People will say to me, and I find it interesting as a forensics profiler, uh, they'll say to me, well, there are random acts that occur in, in, as far as crimes are concerned. Well, let me give you an example of uh, of uh, my view, which is, as a professional, there is no such thing as a random crime. Uh, all crimes are planned. All crimes have someone, or mul actually multiple people, who know they were going to be committed. Um, the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, his brother and his sister-in-law turned him in to federal authorities. They are two of the greatest citizens. When you, when you define what a citizen is in the United States, I think of the two of them, because they loved their brother. They loved Teddy. And they went to the FBI and said, we'll tell you where he is, uh, but just don't kill him. And the FBI kept their word. We were not going to find him. I know the people on that task force, many of them, they said, we're going to find this guy uh, without their help. So what's interesting is, is that uh, there was a prediction of behavior because everyone in his family, friends and family, even though he was isolated in a cabin, no electric no electricity, no running water. They knew that there was something wrong and that he was acting odd and he was disappearing for long periods of time. They had suspicion. Anybody who commits violent acts, whether they be minor or major, anybody who commits crime, people in their lives know that they're going to do that or they have done it. And they keep their mouths quiet because it's inconvenient and they don't want to deal with it. So random just doesn't happen. I had a person I know, certainly not a friend, many years ago who said to me, I got robbed last night. I said, whoa, are you okay? Yeah, I can't believe that you can't, you know, you can't uh, walk around at night without people robbing you. And it was in the suburbs uh, outside of Philadelphia where I live. I said, well, what time was this? He goes, two in the morning. I said, what? I said, what were you out two in the morning? Well, I'd go into a nightclub. And he said, um, ultimately, he said, uh, I went to a, an ATM to get some money. I said, let me get this straight. You got robbed. You got robbed standing at an ATM, uh, which is, even children know, is a lighted box that hands out money in the middle of the night. He goes, well, I should be able to do that. And I said to him, I said, you deserve to get robbed. I said, if you're going to be that stupid, why can't you get money out during the, during the day when there's daylight? And he was offended by that. And I didn't care because this is the problem that people have. They blame everyone else for their issues when it comes to crime when ultimately they create their own problem. And this is where prediction and prevention comes in. A security plan 
which nightclubs rarely put any kind of effort into or thought, are usually designed by managers who have no understanding of corporate security or security management. And this is a problem, folks. Whether you, no matter what type of attorney you are listening to this today, this is a huge issue. The fact that the security plan is usually put together by people that know nothing about commercial security. Let me give you an example. I work with a lot of Fortune 1000 companies, and they have security people, uh, security directors or VPs of security who come out of federal law enforcement. Well, I have many people on my staff who are retired FBI counterterrorism, Secret Service, U.S. military intelligence officers. I have many people who have served their time in federal law enforcement or in the military. And um, I depend on them every day. <clears throat> They're just great investigators, great consultants. The thing is, is that when someone is in a corporate environment, let's say you own a pharmaceutical company and you hire someone from federal law enforcement, the first question HR should be asking, the first question the C-suite executive should ask is, well, what does he or she know about corporate security? What they know is about federal law enforcement. They know about being a federal level cop. Well, what do they know about being in corporate security? Because corporate is very different and they don't know anything. And they're brought in and they're learning on the job. And this is a constant problem, a constant issue within the US. And we see it in our corporate clients all the time where they have people who come in and they assume, horrible word, assume that they understand corporate security and they don't and they're causing more problems than they're solving well in the nightclub world you see the same thing just because you can effectively run a nightclub and make a profit and make money does not mean you understand anything about security and especially corporate security because nightclubs are a for-profit business i've never heard of any non non-profit nightclub so this requires you to understand the concept of predicting violent behavior well, that's my world, profiling. And this is something that you have to understand how to do. You can also call it psychological assessment or behavioral analysis. There's many names for it, but you have to have training in that and experience in that to know how to put that in your security plan so that you can teach all of your people, not just security, but also your managers, how to predict and prevent problems. Prevention is so simple, so simple. You have to have policies in place that say, when this happens, we enact rule number one, and we take action. I was in a school one time, <clears throat> many years ago, and there was a leaky pipe. Building, it was an old, old building, built in the 1930s. I said to the principal, I said, oh, you got some leaky pipes. He says, yeah, and they had a bucket under it. I said, how long has that been going on? He says, since this morning. I said, nobody's fixed it? He goes, well, there's an order in with the maintenance department to fix the leak. And uh, they're, they're going to get it done right before lunch. Well, you know exactly how to finish this story. The bike were first while we were there. We were maybe 100 feet away. Water everywhere. Over $20,000 in damage because the floors in the gym next to this pipe were wood. All they had to do, all they had to do, was make sure that they had dealt with that emergency immediately. Immediately. Because a leaky pipe is an emergency. It's an immediate emergency. But that school had such poor management from the principal I was dealing with down to the maintenance and the, and the, uh, and the custodial staff. These guys were going to get to it when they got to it. It was like looking at a bunch of teenagers waiting to take out the trash. $20,000 in waste of money. Plus, children were dispersed to other schools while the repairs took place for over 10 days. So their lives were disrupted. Again, back to nightclubs, live venues, sporting arenas, security plans are also the are also a weak point in any civil litigation. Understanding how to look at a security plan and understanding if they are writing and executing prediction and prevention policies is critical. Well, what's a prediction and prevention policy? Let's go back to one of the first slides that I showed you. The walk around, a simple walk around would prevent or lower the amount of injury in any kind of shooting situation, a simple walk around would have prevented that. In this case, what really saved Pulse Nightclub from a higher kill rate uh, was the fact that there was an off-duty police officer in that parking lot. Had, had he not been there, this would have been much greater, and I'm qualified to say that. That's the problem. Number three, a security plan is centered on the culture of the venue. It must be customized. 
Again, I go back to one of the first slides that I showed you and one of the first things I talked to you about. You have got to understand what the culture is. You have to understand there's differences. We work with three nightclubs in West Hollywood that are literally within two miles of each other. Those three nightclubs couldn't be more different. They, they are, their, their crowd is different, their structure is different, their layout, even the alcohol they serve is different in those three venues. So they have to be customized. You cannot use off the shelf, one size fits all. And this is part of the problem. So in conclusion, before we take questions, management, management, management is the key to prevention, preventing problems. I don't want to sound like the guy who's beating up Pulse nightclub. If it sounds that way, I apologize. I know they're going through a terrible time right now, but there was no excuse for the laziness and the lack of professionalism. The lack of professionalism that this club had from its management staff, lack of training, lack of proper security, there's no excuse for that. You are taking responsibility at a nightclub for people's lives, for human beings. Because that's what we're talking about here is human beings and human lives. And when you look at the pictures of all those who were killed and all those people who were injured that will never be the same the rest of their lives, both physically and psychologically, this is a travesty that could have been prevented. Could have been prevented. So what I'm going to do now is um, have question time. So do we have any questions? We do have questions, Dale. Um, but before okay. I ask you the very first question, I just need all the attendees to type in the passcode for the Q&A. The very first question we have is, does Pennsylvania have a portal law? Different cities in Pennsylvania have portal laws, yes. It's, okay, it's, a, it's based on a local. It's based on a local municipality. These are not state laws. These are municipal. Uh, uh, these are municipal um, rules and regulations for for municipalities. So it depends on the municipality, and they're okay. different. I mean, New York has a different one than L.A. Some are six feet. Some are three feet. So they're different. Okay. If you could please comment on venue design and verbal control, an example would be helpful. All right. So you have a venue that has a lot of pockets. So in the case of Pulse Nightclub, you had a lot of little alcoves. You had uh, little uh, rooms. It was a very disjointed structure. So trying to communicate, uh, because in a nightclub atmosphere, it's obviously loud. So you have to have quality radios. You have to have earpieces. A lot of nightclub security people don't even carry a radio. And the ones that do, the radios are very poor. They're, they're really lousy. They're not digital level. And they don't have earpieces. They can't hear each other, so they end up using sign language, which is fine. We teach the use of sign language to, uh, to communicate. But there has to be backups and redundancies. And when you have a nightclub where you have pockets of people, the way the nightclub is structured, in the case of Paul, well, as other nightclubs, people will congregate in little pockets here and there. That creates a nightmare when you're trying to evacuate people or when you're trying to communicate with other security people or managers. So the design affects communication, and you have to adjust for that and train for that. Okay, the next question. You mentioned sending a radio message saying, we need to watch these people. Is a statement like that uttered by a security person going to end up being used against the club or the security person as evidence of discriminatory attitudes and biases? No, because if we're not talking about, hey, let's watch this group of black people. We're not talking about that. You're communicating as professionals. I have a group of people just came in the door. They seem a little aggressive. They seem a little loud. They may have already been drinking. We need to watch them and we need to monitor their behavior. There's nothing discriminatory about that, and I've never, in the 400 plus cases we've worked on, I've never seen that come up as an issue. Uh, because uh, the only time it would be an issue is if you're talking about people, um, people's race or ethnicity or something like that. Um, that, that, would, that would be, uh, be wrong, illegal, unethical, unprofessional, and you should pay for that. But we're not talking about communicating like that. We're just talking about uh, here comes a group. This is a very large group. Everybody, they're going over to stage right. There's probably 30 of them. Uh, they seem, it's all guys. It's all male. They seem to be very aggressive. Got to watch them. 
uh, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's no place I've, I've worked in uh, the United States or Canada where that was a problem, communicating uh, to make sure that you are managing that facility correctly. Are there any written standards for security? No. No, because the, the, problem, uh, the problem is that uh, there are several organizations that, uh, like As Is, and As Is provides uh, some template uh, type, uh, type booklets that you can buy, and that's fine. But at some point, you have to sit down and do the hard work, and it is hard work, uh, to customize uh, the template into your own for each facility. So it only gets you... Uh, it only gets you started. It only covers the basics. But, uh, but you still have to do the hard work and customize it, and that's what people don't want to do. And they'll hire us basically to do the hard work because they don't want to take the time to coordinate all of that. It's a lot of writing. You'll feel like you're doing a senior paper in college. So. Where or how can retired federal agents or police officers get training on corporate security that you're describing? training that they can put on their resume or otherwise prove to prospective employers? Well, as is has um, training in that very, uh, that very issue, uh, American Society of Industrial Security. They have certification programs, and those programs are good. They give you uh, fundamentals. They give you the basics. Uh, we do training for, uh, for security, uh, for professional security people, and most of them are coming out of local, state, or federal law enforcement. We do, we do quite a bit of that. Um, but I would, I would say that as is is probably the, uh, the most well-known of, of that training and certification type. Also, um, in most states, not all, but most states have some type of certification for security. And there's nothing wrong with uh, someone who's coming out, rotating out of federal law enforcement or any law enforcement to get that certification through the state they're going to work in because that helps in liability. It's good training. Um, so there's, there's, those are three areas that you can get the training, as is or through us or through basic state certification. Okay. Um, this is a Philadelphia area nightclub case. A patron and two others walk outside where bouncers or security is usually there, but not there, and the plaintiff is attacked. Their defense is that they couldn't predict um, that this would happen since it never happened before. <laughs> it never happened before. Wow. How many times have we heard that excuse? Um, that's ridiculous. And, I'm, of course, I'm hearing one side of the story. But uh, that, that's ridiculous. You, you, you can predict and prevent. Anybody who's listening, by the way, who has children, uh, by the time you have your second child, are you good at predicting and preventing uh, problems with your children. I, I, I hear a lot of people nodding their heads. Um, of course you are. If, you're, if you get the training or have the experience, you can predict and prevent all sorts of behavior. Um, teachers do this routinely. After several years of teaching, they can predict and prevent behavior. So that's a, that's a ridiculous statement. Uh, frankly, it's insulting to the person that got injured or people that got injured. So, uh, yes, you can predict and prevent, but again, you have to you have to be there. You have to physically be there to predict and prevent. Um, you have to control your door. You have to control ingress and egress, what I talked about very early in this, uh, in this webinar. So, To what extent would you say these venue principles would be applicable to other sorts of business entities, like retail clothing stores or grocery stores? Well, that's, a, that's another cup of tea. Uh, when you're talking about retail stores or retail businesses like restaurants, some of this would be relevant, obviously, a security plan, an emergency plan. I mean, think about the fact that uh, if you look in the last six months of all the terrorist attacks involving firearms uh, throughout the world, uh, or look at them just in the U.S. and Canada, uh, you'll see that many of these places are regular businesses. They're not, uh, they're not nightclubs. So some of this would be relevant. There are fundamentals to securing a facility. And one of, one of the things I want to say to all of you is, because I don't want to give the impression that I'm into the militaristic uh, mentality, because we're not. 
We want security to be felt and not seen. When people come to my home, they're always surprised that I don't have laser beams on the on the windows and my doors are unlocked. Uh, you know, they, they're, they're amazed at, at that. They said, I thought it would be like a fortress. I said, well, it is, but you just don't see it. So you have to do business. And nobody wants to walk into a business that feels like a, a military uh, fortification. So in a retail setting, Security should be felt, but not really, uh, not really, should be felt, but not really seen. Um, people say, well, you got to have security guards all over the place. If you think about it, when's the last time you saw a security guard at Walt Disney World? And I can tell you they have 1,400 paramilitary people there with Belgian Shepherds, automatic weapons. That's a full military down there. But you don't rarely, you, you rarely ever see them. Uh, some of them are costume characters. Some are walking around looking like a family. Uh, you know you're secure there. You can sense it, but you don't really see it. It's just it's, it's something you know. So my, my answer to that would be uh, much of this is transferable, but of course has to be customized to the environment. In light of California's adoption of a Dram Shop Act, what liability does a nightclub have for an overserved, intoxicated patron who assaults another person, if any? Well, well, they they have uh, a great deal of liability because this is, um, you know, when when you are not managing your bar and you're you're dispersing a drug. Let's not kid ourselves. Alcohol is a drug, and you're dispersing that drug and you're doing it improperly. Uh, you have liability. And so uh, there are people that sometimes on a state level will try to get limitations on uh, what a bar or nightclub can be held responsible for. Uh, but ultimately, uh, there is, uh, in the rule of law, great precedence in all 50 states that you have to sh have be responsible. And again, that's training. You know, bartenders and waitresses and waiters and server staff need to be trained in understanding this. It's not just a bartender issue. Everybody needs to be watching for intoxication, whether that be drugs or alcohol. Security people certainly need to be watching, but everybody needs to be watching. So um, I, that's, you know, I've got a case right now in California, and it's, it, it's, that's a factor in it, um, the issue of over-serving. And uh, it's, it's uh, that, that law does not... Uh, it doesn't affect it one way or another because you have the precedence that, that was set a long time ago on this. Dale, could you provide a couple of examples of a positive verbal interaction to avoid trouble? Uh, that's complicated. We, we do the power of three, which is an unconscious mind manipulation using words and phrases and body language. It takes, um, takes about an hour and a half just to, to learn it. Um, that that's hard to do. It's it's not it's not as simple as that. It's it's something that it's a skill that you have to be trained and in and develop. Uh, it, it, there's no easy shortcuts to that. I, I would love to give you an easy answer, but there's there's not. Uh, you have to learn the power of three, the unconscious manipulation, um, and we've had great success with it. People love it, but it does take time to learn. There's no way to even explain it to you, uh, it would take time. So I'm sorry, but I can't give an example of that. Do you recommend security personnel be armed? Uh, well, you need to have, if you've got a nightclub and you have a variety of people coming in the door, I don't care if you're in the suburbs or an urban area, it doesn't matter. Uh, you need to have somebody armed. My as, as a professional and our company, we are very adamant about hiring off-duty police officers. Um, we believe that if you have that option, that's your best option. Never, 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 in our, in our professional opinion, should you hire outside security guard companies. But off-duty police officers serve a very important purpose. They have arrest capabilities, they have firearms, and they have the right training. So. Um, if you have someone who has been in the military or law enforcement and can get trained and certified to carry and understands the power of that, uh, absolutely. But 
nothing should ever happen inside that building. It should everything should be taken outside or kept outside. So the person with the firearm is going to be at the door, um, but that should be subtle. That shouldn't be. It shouldn't be sitting on their hip like a, a sheriff in an old western. That should be very subtle carry, um, concealed carry, and that requires training and the right person to use it. If you go to Las Vegas, by the way, and you go to any jewelry store, pawn shop, any of those places, they are armed to the teeth. You'll see the same thing in Reno. You'll see the same thing in other cities around the United States. You go to these jewelry stores, they're armed to the teeth, and, and they won't even hire you unless you been in combat and you have a confirmed kill. So they've got their own soldier team, their own uh, warrior team to protect them. So I don't think you have to go to that extreme, but at the same time, um, I think having an armed person there is very important. I mean, did you ever notice that movie theaters started, what, eight years ago, seven years ago, having local police sit out there in front of the movie theater on Saturday and Sunday nights or Friday and Saturday nights? Why do you think that is? Um, this is part of the homeland security effort to get the head, the head of the, uh, the heads of the uh, movie theater uh, companies out of the sand, and get them to understand the reality of the threat against them. So, um, so my answer to your question is yes, but they should be highly trained and qualified professionals. Okay, this is a situation where there's a nightclub and a hotel. A man is ejected for drunk or disorderly um, contact and uh, conduct into the hotel lobby. The second man later asks to leave, pulls a gun, shoots security guards in the club, goes into the lobby of the hotel where he was originally ejected, and attempts to stop the shooter and is killed. What is the best resource for creating coordinated plans between two entities? Well, first of all, the nightclub and the hotel security people and management need to be co-trained together. They need to sit down and look at their emergency plan and their security plans and see where they overlap and where they are contradictory to each other. I don't have all the details, but just on the face of it, when you eject someone, you have to walk them out with two people at minimum, if not more. You need to, if they're showing any signs of aggression, you need to call the police. And you need to walk them out the door and make sure police show up uh, so that you, they can be secured because they're acting aggressively. If, if you get kicked out of a nightclub, the nightclub owners want to make money. So ultimately, to get kicked out of a nightclub, you have to do something pretty bad. Um, in this case, you, you're throwing them out into the hallway of the hotel is what it sounds like to me. If I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, hotel doesn't have any idea what's going on, so you're putting the patrons at risk. Uh, this just sounds like a, um, a comedy of errors. Uh, this was sim simple to fix, which was having meetings and planning and training so that the both entities work together. But ultimately, it sounds like the ejection was done in incorrectly. There's a certain way of ejecting people. There's a science to it. Just like John Taffer, who we know in our industry is the king of uh, resurrecting bars and nightclubs, uh, Taffer says that our science is a science, and he's right, and security is a science. And there's a certain way of doing it, a certain way of, of protecting people, and again, it's about people being protected. So. And what kind of training or experience should the bouncers or security, security guards have at, like, a local tavern? Well, you have to, you can't depend on, on them having training that qualifies for your standard. You have to have your own standard. So in the case of a tavern, which would be uh, serving food and drink, I assume, uh, you have to get training for that. You, you've got to get training that you control, that when someone sues you, you're able to say, okay, here's the training they took. They took it twice a year, at minimum twice a year. Here's the curriculum of what they were taught, and here's the CV of the, of the trainer that taught them. You should be able to produce those documents in the event that there's a contemplated legal action. That's important. And by the way, <clears throat> if you're an attorney suing a tavern or a nightclub, this is part of, a small part of the discovery list that you should be asking for. And that, that's very important that you have qualified people that know what to ask for, because that's how you resolve these suits quick, quickly. 
is when the other side, the, the nightclub or tavern in this case, can't produce those documents. They get scared and they understand they better come up with real money and settle at the number you're looking for. But, uh, but ultimately, you have to get training. If this person comes to you and says, well, I worked at such such a nightclub. Oh, that's a cool nightclub. Yeah, they trained me. And you accept that? You should be sued into bankruptcy for accepting that. That's You don't know what training they got. You're taking their word for it. You don't take their word for anything. You provide the training for them so you know what they were taught and when they were taught it. And they and by the way, they should be certified. One of the things that we do in our training is we make them take a written test at the end of the training. And they have to pass <laughs> with an 80% or they don't get certified. This is a great way for HR to get rid of people that are not meeting the standards that you need to get rid of is, is certification. And, and if, you, if you get training for your security, and by the way, again, security needs to be trained with the management. If you get training for them on security and emergency management and nobody has a written test at the end, you know, you're getting ripped off because ultimately it's just a lecture and a couple of fun drills. How do you prove that they actually learned anything if there's no written test? And then we have a physical test at the end, too, where they have to actually show competency in what we train them in to do. And we don't give them scripts. We just say, show us the power of three. Here's the scenario. Show it to us. And if they can't do it, <clears throat> that's half of their uh, score. So, you know, you, you have to really step up your game if you want to protect yourself from uh, losing your club uh, losing your restaurant, uh, and protecting your patrons. I mean, at some point, this is a moral issue. You, you're, these people depend on you to protect them when you walk in the door, or when they walk in the door. You know, you have your, their lives in your hands, not just in the quality of cleanliness in the kitchen, not killing them with bacteria, but also some person coming in that has an issue with a waitress or a waiter. They had some kind of a domestic squabble at home. No one's managing the the staff, so they didn't know about it, the person comes in and starts shooting. This is a common problem, by the way, in Walmart. Walmart has a lot of these types of events. So, again, management, management, management. So, so Dale, our last question is, are written post orders cards in venue sites? I'm sorry, repeat it again? Sure. Are written post orders used for guards in venue sites? Well, yes, you should have um, every shift, every day requires a new posting schedule for the guards. And you have to move them. They can't stand in one place all night. You should have uh, one of the things we did at Live Nation when we were brought in there in 2000. Um, we, we created uh, Blues Busters. And uh, these were people that sat very high up um, during a concert event, and they could see everything from aerial view. Uh, I guess now you could do it with a drone. Um, we also had roving patrols uh, moving through the facility. If someone's standing still, they're only seeing part of the picture. They need to move. You know, standing still at a post for a long period of time is not good security. It's not proper protocol. You have to have movement going on. You have to move people to different places so the eyes are fresh, they're not getting tired. So uh, a written posting schedule for a live event, for a tavern, for a nightclub, for any place, that has to be written up uh, just like you write up a schedule for your employees uh, every day, every time you're open. It has to be something new. Never put them in the same place. You're just asking for trouble. <laughs> Excuse me. Dale, thank you so much. Um... In addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for the past 60 years, ESSA also offers e-discovery and forensic solutions, free interactive webinars, cybersecurity services, and day-in-the-life videos. We also offer research reports on expert witnesses, Challenge History Report 2.0, the Preliminary Screening Report, and Expert Profile 360. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending, and most especially Dale Yeager for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Dale, or if you would like to speak with a TASA representative regarding an expert witness for a case that you are working on, please contact TASA at 1-800-523-2319. Um, this concludes our program for today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.